and welcome to episode number seven of That 60s Recording Podcast. Uh, my name is Joe Montague and I am your host. Um, I hope you've all had a lovely couple of weeks. Um, I'm recording this on my birthday today. Hey, hey, I won't tell you how old I am because I'm officially moving into the getting old category. <laughs> um, wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't say I'm getting old, but I'm uh, I'm certainly not a young man anymore. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, so today we are chatting to, um, I, I can't even believe that I'm about to say who we're chatting to, to Alan White, um, who is a legendary drummer um, with Yes, um, played on John Lennon's Imagine album, um, and he played on George Harrison's All Things Must Pass album, and he's the longest serving member of Yes. Um, so in in the, the episode today, we discuss how he started out um, playing in covers bands in the North East um, before entering a competition that was judged none other than by Ringo and Brian Epstein, which is, uh, I mean, that must have been uh, insane. I, I can't imagine a, a modern day equivalent of that. That's, that's madness. Um, and I asked him about um, how he felt... Um, going over to Canada to play with um, John Lennon on no rehearsals um, and then finding himself playing on um, some of the most seminal albums of all time. Um, and then uh, it, then we, we take a little slight detour <laughs> into some bird watching, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I should also mention that you'll hear um, Alan's wife, Gigi, is there as well. Um, I think she sat in the background of the, the conversation, but she um, she has a few things to say um, towards the end. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. They were both absolutely lovely. Um, I say, say this every week about all of my guests, um, but I, I can't believe how generous... Um, so some of these people are with their time and their stories and um you know it's a real privilege to get to speak to these people um and you know somebody of alan's stature uh to give up some time to speak to me about his experiences is uh I, to say i'm grateful is an understatement um so i really hope you enjoy listening to this conversation um so here he is mr alan white if it's all right with you i, I, I want to speak to you mainly about growing up um, through the sixties and playing music, um, influenced by uh, sort of beat music that was coming out, and then your journey through the sixties into the early seventies, uh, sort, yeah. sort of culminating in in joining. Yes, you started on the wrong foot there because I haven't grown up yet. <laughs> I just, I think um, all musicians are a bit like that. We all like to think we are. Of course they are. Yeah. Um, when you get to do something, you're successful uh, through your, your whole life, uh, doing something you really enjoy doing, you know, it's like the perfect world for a lot of people. Absolutely. That's and, a- yeah. um, so am I right in thinking that you started playing piano first before drums? Yeah. Um, when I was six, I started taking piano lessons. Okay. And that a good knowledge of uh, melody and kind of. So uh, it helped me a lot. I still play now and I write from the yes stuff on on the piano. And um, that it was a good kind of. They always say it's good to have two instruments, but uh, piano and drums are about the two best ones I can think of. Uh, because of the percussive feel, I'm. I tend to agree with you. I I started on piano uh, at age eight before taking up drums at about the same time as you, about twelve. Um, so I'm. Uh, I, I, I want to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as a result, in my style of drumming during the later years and through my teens and into my into the twenties, you know. I maintained a sense of melody in the drumming I did. So I think I that's something I, I if I was to describe your drumming, that's definitely something. I mean, you're a you're a song drummer, um, for sure. If you, I, I hope you don't mind me saying, and uh, I'm sure that that comes from um, 
I, I think comes from having a great knowledge of melody and harmony and, and not worrying too much about technicalities of drums, just worrying about playing to the song. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's actually because you have that education in, in melody, um, it adapts you to be able to read into what the drums should be doing on individual tracks. Like that. Yeah. So you got your your kit at age twelve. Do you do you remember what that kit was? Uh, well, I had an Ajax when I first started. Um, it was I don't know if you've heard of Ajax. It's I, I have, yeah. Movie. Yeah. Well, I had a white pearl Ajax and. Uh, that lasted about three months because I kept going to the drum store in Newcastle, England, seeing this Ludwig drum kit, and I thought it was a bee's knees. And, uh, <laughs> and so my my father and my uncle uh, handed together. My uncle was a drummer, my father was a genius, so it was perfect. And... Um, and finally, they they bought it for me, and it was silver, silver sparkle, Ludwig, from nineteen sixty six. Lovely. I still have that drum kit. Do you really? Yeah, and I played on, um, I played on Imagine with it, and um, My Sweet Lord, and all those hits. Wow. That was that drum kit. That's unbelievable that that was your, you you bought that so quickly after just starting and then got to use it on, um, yeah, on well, that. It was a dream because you were buying the luxury version of what you should be doing. <clears throat> that's that's yeah, absolutely that's astounding. I think it was like the Rolls Royce of drums, you know. Do you remember the name of the shop that you bought it from? Because there's a couple of really good quality oh, drum shops. In Newcastle. It was an old, it was an old established um, drum store that had been there for years. Mm. In fact, when I first started, I went there for a couple of lessons with, with one guy. And I started realizing that he was trying to teach me how to play like him. And I said, stop this. I don't want to play like that. It sucks. <laughs> so from then on, I kind of developed my own style. So did you join a band quite quickly after starting to play? Yeah. Uh, about, well, it's about three months, I think it was. And that was that the downbeats that you were you started? Yeah. No, it was it was before the downbeats. It was a couple of guys who plonked around on the guitar and they'd come around and plug in in the in the you know, living room in the lounge and uh, we just mess around for a while. It wasn't really serious stuff. Um, I was going to school and I had a uh, I had a paper round I had to do, so uh, about once or twice a week we'd, we'd just get together and create a bit of noise. <laughs> and what were you listening to? What sort of songs were you trying to play? Oh, it was usually, uh, it was like Shadows and Rock and Roll, Tommy Steele and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> um, And then did the... The downbeats formed sort of just after. That was, the downbeats were mainly uh, Beatles stuff. Okay. Uh, we used to do a, a, a Beatles show um, that was, uh, you know, we all wore the Beatles suits, and I was the youngest drummer in the northeast of England, and, you know, got, we got a reputation for that. And, uh, we used to play working men's clubs, and but they'd never let me go out, out where the beer was. I had to stay backstage the whole night. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a lot of the lads in the band would bring me a half a beer back. 
every now and then. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure you found a way. Um, What's that? I was going to say, I'm sure you found a way. I know I would have done. Uh, you know, you know, quick off and uh, didn't hurt anybody. <laughs> um, and at that point, did you have uh, aspirations to play music professionally or was it just fun for you at that stage? Uh, I was just getting on with having fun. It was basically a lot of fun doing what I was doing, you know. The Downbeats... You changed names to the Blue Chips and entered a, a contest in um, in London, um, which is where you won uh, well, your first recording contract. Well, yeah, we we went to London and well, first of all, we won the regional finals in in, in County Durham, all of the northeast, and then. And then we, we number one, we couldn't believe we won that because there was some good bands playing. And then uh, we jumped in our paddy wagon kind of thing. It was an old um, Bedford ambulance. It had lots of lipstick all over it from <laughs> girls screaming and running after us down the street. Uh, <laughs> They thought that was the thing to do because we played Beatles music. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was all covered in lipstick. And uh, I remember it was pretty dangerous because um, the one of, it was two of the, the guys in the band were from, from a family um, yeah, from Spennymoor in uh, the Northeast. And they were thought they were relatively okay mechanics and could fix things up, so they'd work for a while. And the whole back axle of the car was chained on with chains. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, uh, and we used to sit in that, and we went all the way to London, and uh, and we performed the, the London Palladium. Wow. With uh, the the judges were Ringo and Silla Black, Brian Epstein and Alan Jackson. I don't know if you remember that. No, you're, you're not old enough. I don't <laughs> think he was a he was a well known DJ guy in the radio. Uh, okay, that must have. I mean, how did that feel? Is what were you then? About sixteen. Um, I uh, yeah, something like that. Fifteen or sixteen. How did it feel to be performing in front of you know Brian Epstein and Ringo and and Silla Black for that matter? It uh, and presumably these are people you'd listen to and look up, looked up to, and um, you know, wanted to emulate. And... Actually, um, we actually, um. Played a little bit of, of music that we wrote between us. Okay. One of the songs we played was like that. It was a, um, it was a original. So, and then a mixture of a couple of other Beatles songs, and and then uh, to our surprise, we won the whole damn thing. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Um, and then we we got a little trophy, jumped in the van again, and went back to County Durham. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and then uh, you know, we obviously we started getting lots of gigs. We were playing seven or eight times a week, you know, even, even Saturday afternoon. And then uh, we built up. A reputation, but then you know all my exams and stuff came at school, and uh, my GCE, you know all that stuff, and and uh, they made me curb down how many nights playing I was doing, hmm. and then the <laughs> the, uh, the 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 uh, teachers knew. But I was in the band, and 
they kept an eye on me, and especially the math teacher. And he got he got um, he got pretty upset at me, and he used because I I was actually making more than him when I was about that age. <laughs> And he, he didn't like it at all. Wow. So, so did you um, did you have a recording contract at that point? Had you done any recording? Well, we, when we did that, we won a recording contract um, uh, with, what was the name of the guy? It wasn't Mickey Mouse. It was the guy that did Downtown. Okay. Google Clark. Anyhow, he was supposed to be our producer, and, and it was with Pi Records. <laughs> and do you remember the, sh- the name of the studio you went to? Um, I think we went to Decca. Okay. In the very, very early days, yeah. And do you remember anything from... That that session. I mean, was that the first time you'd ever done any recording? And now the first recording we did was um, in Newcastle. We had a. Um, we all went in there, and um, you could pay money uh, to have an acetate made. You know, they they went straight from the microphone straight onto the disc. There was no mixing. You just mixed it through a desk that you just played the song and it went, it cut it straight under the disc. Okay. And I remember we got one each and um, my mother, before she died, she still had that somewhere, but I don't know where it is now. And it, the song was by Bonnie from the Beatles. You know, the Beatles did it. Yeah. It's an old song. Yeah, that was it. Oh, cool! And so, was the when you went to record for Decca? Was that a a bit that must have been a, a fairly significant step up in terms of yeah, quality? Yeah, I don't remember that much about that. Actually, I know we went in there and we recorded a a song that I didn't think it was very good, but uh, it was kind of slapstick. And, you know, and um, that was it, really. We went back home. Uh, nothing, nothing came of it all at right. all. So the next um, kind of big landmark I've I've noted um, in sort of my timeline of, of your career is joining Billy Fury's band. But what happened between the, the sort of um, the blue chips, as they were called then, and, and joining Billy Fury? Yeah. Uh, well, we were still doing gigs with the Blue Chips, and we got a pretty good reputation. And um, I have no idea why we called it the Blue Chips, but I used to wonder what it meant, Blue Chips and all this stuff. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, that kind of petered out because... Um, the, I think what happened uh, around that time was when I got offered to play with Billy Fury um, with his backing band called The Gamblers. Yeah. It was uh, a band from Newcastle. Oh, okay, because Billy Fury was, was from Liverpool, wasn't he? And, and uh, So his backing band was Newcastle-based, and that's where the link was. Yeah, but uh, Billy Fury, I only ever did two weeks of cabaret with Billy Fury. Okay. Uh, And I always remember Billy Fury because his hands were the biggest hands I'd ever seen in my life. (laughs) (laughs) They were huge, and that's why he used to do all that stuff with his hands in front of his face all the time. (laughs) And so were you still playing around the north of England at that point, or had you gone further afield? Well, uh, with the gamblers, we didn't do much else but back him, and then we went off to Germany, which my mother was very scared to do, but she let me go. So 
uh, she really helped my career along as I would have been staying. But then I came, you know, I was still, I went to college. I went to, te- they call it a technical college. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, I was studying to be a bloody architect. <laughs> That was my forte at school, was technical drawing. Ah. So, uh, ah. And uh, that and geography, and I was pretty good at math, which helped a lot later in playing the drums. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I think they say um, good mathematicians, well, either musicians make good mathematicians or the other way around. Yeah. Um, I, I think. The math really helped me a lot with uh, creating stuff and playing with the F because you have to count a lot of weird time signatures, stuff like that. So it helped me down the line. So once you'd finished um, playing with uh, with Billy Fury, um, I've got the the sort of bridge between there and and getting the the sort of infamous call from Lennon. Um, were you you working with Ginger Baker's band Air Force at that point? No, prior to that, I was with my own band. Um, kind of the remnants of all that stuff, the Gamblers, and then we formed this other band of elite musicians from the northeast, and we all went to London to make a fortune and all that kind of stuff, you know, and. Uh, much to our dismay, it was really hard work for a long time and uh, never really quite made it. But, you know, we were all living in the same house. I was cooking meals. My mother taught me to cook at an early age, so I'd make beef stew every every weekend for us all to live on. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that lasts about three days. And <laughs> all we, it, was one, it was like a lot of bands in England that grew up to be really good, like the Traffic and, you know, all of those kind of bands. Lived in a house in the country, and that, all we did every day is get up and play music from lunchtime till we went to bed. <laughs> Very cool. What a way to live. Uh, other proficient English musicians got to be really good. <laughs> so then, what um, what were you doing? So as I've sort of mentioned, I'm leading up to to sort of 1969 when you got the the call from Lennon to go and over to Toronto. What were you doing? Um, sort of in the months prior to that. I we we were kind of like doing a lot of gigs around London, and we were based out of Wembley. Okay. Uh, and we all lived in a house, the same house again, and you know, obviously people experimenting with smoking weed and you know all that kind of stuff, and uh, um, we we got a good reputation in in London clubs for um, uh, being a really good band. We played a lot of kind of R&B and Salmon Days and stuff like that. And we had a great uh, singer who was Anglo-Indian guy, and he had a really, really great voice. In fact, he sings on, on my first solo album. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard that. Have you ramshackle? No, I'm a. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't heard it. Okay, there's some interesting. That will give you the gist of what the band was proficient at and how good we sounded. It was an eight-piece band. We had three three people in the horn section. It was really really cool on stage. All right, I'm, I'm definitely going to have a listen to that, and I'll I'll put some links into the the notes for this show so that other people can go and find it. Exactly, came out in seventy six. Seventy six, super. Okay, I'll find it. Um, uh, it came out on Atlantic actually, because at that period of time, everybody in the US made solo albums, and I decided to 
after working on all this music for many years with that band, it was a a good vehicle for me to get that music out to the public. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm, I'm going to have a listen, um, and I'll definitely link to that. So then, um, th- I'm. I'm s- still sort of hovering around this phone call. Were you? Did it? Did it come completely out of the blue, or were you? Were you moving in circles that were connected with? Um, well, I know, I knew a couple of people in Apple, and I kind of, I occasionally would go down and hang around in Apple, and it, you know, in uh, where was it in? What's the name of the street with the tailors on it in London? <clears throat> right off of Oxford Street. Anyhow, that's where Apple was, the headquarters. And um, it was kind of free, free to come and go kind of place for a lot of, quite a few musicians. I mean, you go in there and you could hang around in in different rooms and uh, occasionally, on a wild occasion, you'd, one of the Beatles would come and walk into. So I, I I had a couple of friends who worked there and we used to go there and go for a pint and that kind of stuff, you know. And um, I figured they knew my name from that, but then I heard that um, John saw me playing with that band I'm talking about in a club, but I never knew he was there and I never saw him. But um, that's how he saw me play. And he, when he came to do live piece in, in Toronto, um, he, he, I got a call from him. And, and it was right out the blue because I, I, I didn't think it was him. And I put the phone down on him. <laughs> and then, and then uh, he called back. He said, no, it's me. I've got a gig tomorrow. Will you do it, kind of thing, and um, so uh, that's how that kind of came came about. Next thing I know, I'm going to the airport in a limo, and and it was all really, really. It was all kind of over in two days. I went there. We got jumped on the plane, rehearsed on the plane, and went and played in front of 25,000 people. And then turned around, left, and got on a plane and came back to England, and that was that. Yeah. <laughs> what was going on in, in, in your mind, having grown up playing um, Beatles covers, and suddenly... I say suddenly. I mean, it. It sounds like it's it's suddenly, but it happens very fast. You're playing with John Lennon. I mean, there's songs that you played on that on that album that um, are Beatles songs that presumably, like Dizzy Miss Lizzy, presumably you'd played that already live, um, perhaps before with with cover bands, and um, and you were there doing it with an actual Beatle, and they were recording it too. I mean, no pressure. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was kind of, I don't know. I must have got a, a relatively good reputation of, of being um, a good a good drums, a, a good player. And, uh, and um, I seem to just kind of have a knack of knowing what to play when and just fit in with what was necessary for the song. And I... I certainly believe that still today. You know, did it feel um, did it feel natural um, to sort of step into to that role in that band with those people? Um, I mean, I, I guess, I guess you would you would have had some nerves, but you must have been yeah. confident uh, enough in your abilities. I was only twenty years old. You've got to remember at this point. I was only twenty years old, and uh, um, I was kind of just still growing up in the music industry. And um, I didn't really realize what I was doing at the time. I just got on with it and knew when they counted for, I came in and played. And and then all of a sudden, 
that was kind of over, but um, I still had a reputation for being able to adapt pretty easily. Did anything change for you um, from coming home, just once you came home from that session, uh, from that, uh, sorry, concert, did any, was it just business as usual back working with the band again? Um, I'm sort of leading up to going into the studio to record. Um, we were still working with the band, doing that, but I do the occasional session and then the sessions, got to be more and more and more working in the studio and playing an album. So I played, I must have played on 60 albums after that. Oh, wow. The next couple of years or three years. And uh, I got a reputation as a studio musician in London. And, you know, I spend the money half the time keeping the band alive. <laughs> My own band. It was just, it was like I could could you know go out to work and bring the bacon home and keep everybody alive so we could play good music. What were the recording sessions like? Um, I mean, aside from from some of the, the the bigger albums, which I'd like to talk about, but they're just the day to day sessions that you know you get a call to go and play on an artist's album and you turn up to the studio. What what was the um, sort of process like of learning the material and, and was it was it just a day's work for you? Well, you know, I used to, in a few of the sessions, not all of them, um, they give me the charts and stuff like that. And I, I kind of, I because of playing the piano, I could read the charts to a degree, and I wasn't great at it. And uh, most of it was just rubbish because you can't have a guy who plays violin right for drums. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, this is rubbish. But I, and I, uh, half the time, the artist or whoever I was working with, I'd say, how about this? This is much better. And they go, sure, that's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just gave up in the end and did my own thing. <laughs> um, well, it stood you in good stead, it sounds like, for sure. Yeah. Do you remember, um, were you taking any notice of the way they were micing your kit up or any of the sort of technical sides of the recording or were you just focusing on playing? Uh, I did I did to a degree, but I was mostly interested in the artistic side of making the song sound good. Um, but I did gain knowledge of the desk and, you know, mixing and to a certain degree, but I didn't excel at it. Okay. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about... Um, a couple of the, the, the sort of obvious, obvious seminal albums that you played on. So in 1970, so, so not long after um, doing the concert with John, you, you played on All Things Must Pass, and presumably that was a little different. The sessions for that came about differently to just a, a run-of-the-mill um, artist session that you would have done. Yeah. Um, well, I got to know George through playing with John. As I, um, imagine with the first album I met George, he used to come to the studio and we'd all eat dinner every night about seven o'clock and I would sit next to George sometimes and we struck up a, a relationship and what a wonderful guy he was. So, And then when he decided to make an album, he called me and I'd turn up every day. Uh, <laughs> We'd all turn up every day and we'd decide who's going to play what and all this stuff. So we all just liked to play with me and um, I ended up playing on about two-thirds of that album. Um, what were those sessions like? I've, I've, um, I mean, I'm have sure, i I'm sure I can say it. I've heard some of the, the bootleg recordings of, of it and they sound like quite enjoyable, fun sessions to have been there for, just almost... A bit yeah, of a jam it, session. It, yeah, it was kind of like a team of people turned up every day and with one object is to make a great 
free sounding track that day and um we spend time and detail over most tracks, but some tracks were very instant, you know. Do you um do you remember what kit you were using at that time? Was that the Ludwig still? Same kit. The same kit I'm talking about, yeah. Wow. I I find that unbelievable that 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 that's the, that that you bought that kit three months after pl- starting playing, and here you are using it on a George Harrison record. That's I, I played that kit for a lot of years, and I used to tell people this is an interesting drumming fact. <laughs> um, in the in the sixties, um, Ludwig used to paint the inside of the bass drum white. Right? Yeah. And I used to, oh, that's why it's louder. It's white. <laughs> <laughs> the, and, the, the, the sound yeah. reflects around on the way. <laughs> and you get a lot of people going, no. And I said, yeah, it's white, so it sounds louder. And anyhow, um, half the people didn't believe me, uh, but uh, some people did. <laughs> they painted them the size of their drums right to get them louder. <laughs> it's um I don't <clears throat> don't know what year Gretsch started to do the the silver one, didn't they? Maybe it was a bit of a fad for it. Yeah. Um uh, so what yeah, do you I had Gretsch drum kit once and uh, I, I bought the Gretsch drum kit and then the first time I ever played it I broke it. <laughs> broke a couple of things and I said, I don't like Gretsch at all, I'll just break them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were known to be known to be more of a jazz drum kit. Yeah, I I um I grew up listening to a lot of jazz and I, I can remember I can picture every every jazz drummer I picture has a Gretsch kit and then I'd always have Lud, uh, Ringo in my head using a Ludwig kit and then that you know, that one Ludwig for pop and rock. And uh, Gretsch for jazz. We had, a, we had a reputation for being very solid and good rock and roll drum kit. Yeah. Do you remember what symbols you were using at that time? As uh, Zildjian. I started using Zildjian the same time as I got Ludwig. Okay, so was it the Avidis series? The same thing. Only I only I have about twenty five drum kits now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you... They, kept, they kept giving them to me and I said no, I, I don't want another one I've got enough to last me a lifetime <laughs> where'd you keep I them all? <laughs> well I I still have a lot of drum kits and I've got one storage unit in Seattle that's full of drum kits wow um, but, um, you know, they kept giving me different colors because they wanted me to use them with yes to get the publicity for it. So um, I really could ask Ludwig for anything they want, and I still count to this day, but I don't abuse it. Yeah. A lot, you know, a lot of drummers would abuse that situation, but I never have. So. Um, I'd I'd like to hear what um what you remember of the imagine sessions with lennon i mean that's a that's one of the kind of most respected albums in history and to have been a part of that is is very very special so i'd, I'd love to know what you remember of that time yeah i remember um a, a lot about those sessions because i could just the, the main thing i remember about the sessions was the vibe in the room um in you know every song we we played john would give us the lyrics beforehand and he'd say look these are the lyrics this is what you're going to say to the world that you want to play on it or not and you know and he always gave us the option which was very cool to start with that's really really interesting i um what a, a almost like a quite a lovely way to do it that um, so you you're understanding the emotion behind the song before you've even played on it. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, you, you, it would. He wanted people to understand the words. I think he was 
mainly referring to a, a, a particularly one song, uh, which was How Do You Sleep at Night, because he wrote it about Paul. So I think he, he felt a little bit, um, I don't want you to get in trouble with Paul kind of thing, you know, but I didn't really know Paul. I, I knew all the rest of the Beatles, including Ringo, but only years later I got to know Paul. Yeah. What was... um. I can imagine those sessions as being quite a relaxed atmosphere. Um, is, would you say that that was the case? Yeah, it was very relaxed. And, but John was certainly driven by uh, him and Yoko and the message they wanted to get out in a lot of that music. So that was the main focus in the end. And um, do you remember anything? Uh, this is kind of the the nerdy side of me coming out. But I, I want. Do you remember? Do you remember anything about this sort of how the way your kit was mic'd? We was there a lot of mics, or was it just sort of mono, single overhead, or? Um, um not very basic micing. Um, you know, two two overheads, bass drum, snare drum, and um. You know, like a Shure 57 on all the all the uh, toms, and no mic in top and bottom head. It was all just mic from the top in those days. Yeah, and um, and I just think the drum sound on that record is so full and rich, and I'm I'm sure a lot of that's to do with the your playing, obviously, and and the drums themselves, um, and the way well, that. So um, Phil Spector was really good at getting drum sounds, I think. Um, he, he, or the engineer was kind of thing, but he, he knew what he wanted to hear, Phil Spector. I think that's what they, one of the things that I, I always think it makes a great producer is somebody that knows what they, that can envision what they want in their mind's eye before they come and get to it. And that sounds like what you're describing in Phil Spector. Yeah, it's like, it's like Trevor Horn uh, when he was in, in, in Yes. He had a good ear for the kind of drum sound he wanted. Mm. And Trevor Raven as well was another person in the 80s with Yes who really knew his drum sounds. Were you, were you using any... I. I apologize for the nerdiness of this question, but were you were you dampening the drums at all at that point or was it were they wide open? I needed dampening. I don't you know, you gotta drum, you gotta let it sing and, and let it resonate. Um and all this dampening was I guess it was good for certain songs and that I just like and I still do today to have a real Real live drum kind, uh, uh, you know. If they if they want to do that, they can find other ways of doing it. Because I think when you have a live sound at the source, you can mess with it later if you want to. But I prefer a live sound, um, not dampened and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, where were you? Um, so the the songs that you played on, I mean, this, I guess this is an a, an open question for. I'm I'm still thinking about the uh, the All Things Must Pass album and Imagine. I'm just interested in the creative process about them. Were were you getting into the studio and and would, was John playing a song for you and you jammed it and and then sort of pushed record or um, were you sort of coming up with parts in the moment that were being recorded that at the same point? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all I ever remember John saying, it, it, um, I think it stems from instant karma when I played on that, right? Because, the, you know, the drum break in instant karma that's kind of out of meter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I kept doing that, and John would look at me going, 
you kind of have a puzzled look at each face. <laughs> and I thought, well, I wonder if I'm doing it right. I'm not, you know. And then in the end, he came up to me and he said, Oh, I have no idea what you're doing, but keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, my, my um, attitude towards drums at that time was I used to like to play drum breaks that were out of meter with the general uh, rhythm of the track, as it were. So you just step aside for a moment and then you get back in the track. And that's where all that came from. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I, um, I enjoy that kind of um, that kind of drum break where you you're not sure where one's gone anymore. And then when it comes back in, it's quite satisfying to pick up the beat again at a, a point where you were expecting. Taking it from a shuffle beat and then playing a rock and roll beat in the middle of it and, uh, and then stepping back into the shuffle beat, but being able to do it instantly. <laughs> did you, um, I, did you feel any, um, any pressure as a young man, having grown up with Ringo's playing, to 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 live up to any of that, or were you just not not worried about any any? Um, uh... well, I to adapt uh, in in my teenage years. I started listening to a lot to uh, uh, kind of weather report and. Jazz fusion bands and you know Jack Dejonet and a lot of kind of great drummers from that kind of era. Lenny White was one of my favorite drummers. Okay. Um, you know, way back then. Um, <clears throat> so you know, um, and I, as it happens, I met him a couple of times later in in life, and he's. Really cool guy, really nice guy. Um, Alphonse moves on. Um, a lot of those kind of players. So they affected my my style of drumming from the side at a distance, but I still maintain the rock and roll feel and try to mix both styles together. And um, that became very successful for me. Yeah, the have you having said that kind of answers a question that I was going to ask a little, um, sort of a further down the the timeline. But that it feels like it was a natural progression to to the kind of music that Yes played, um, given what you just said you were listening to. Um, well, it, I, it proved um, really valuable when I got into Yes, and I had to play things like. First thing I had to learn was close to the edge, which freaked me out. So, um, which is a complete mixture of, of both things, you know. I mean, every, the whole beginning of a song is in 12 8. And then, then it meanders off into rock and roll and all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> that was all the only the tip of the iceberg to what other stuff we came up as. Is uh, that band carried on? Were you aware of Yes as a band before you were asked to join them? What's that? Sorry. Were you aware of Yes before you got the call to join them? Well, I uh, I was um, sharing an apartment with Eddie Offord, who was Yes's producer. <laughs> okay, so yeah, <laughs> the first three albums. So. Um, I yeah, I was familiar with them, and I saw them on stage a couple of times, but not that much. I just knew they had a great organ sound, and uh, and the music was different, but good. But um, you know, I, I didn't put it into a category really because a lot of people label yes music, but um, it's it's it, it, it is its own category, really, because it's so influenced by a lot of different kinds of music. 
Absolutely, I think that's a, that's exactly how I describe it. And and it was another one of those situations where you got the call to do the shows with a well a handful of days notice three three days notice was it before starting touring yeah. in USA. Well, I didn't get get the call. Um, I was playing with Joe Crocker at the time, and I was uh, we were finish it was the last night of the Joe Cocker tour of Europe, Mad Dogs and Englishmen. And uh, and my business manager, the guy kind of looked after business stuff for me, called me, he said, Alan, jump on a plane in the morning, get straight back here as quick as possible. Uh, yes, want you to join him. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> Uh, but I had a prior experience with Yes because um, they were rehearsing um, in in a, uh, a small sewing shop in in Shepherd's Bush, and I was out with Eddie one night, and he said he had to pass by the studio, so I went by with him, and that night Bill Bill Bruford wasn't. Um, they were having problems with him in the band, and I think he was in the process of starting King Crimson. And um, I went down there, and Bill left, and he said, I have to go and have dinner. And, and they were all stood there with the guitars on, and I and then Eddie said, well, why don't it? it was before they recorded Close to the Edge. And um, the song was Siberian Couture, which is a bar of eight and bar seven, bar eight, bar seven. <laughs> and um, Eddie said, I don't can play that kind of stuff. Do you want to just sit in? And uh, so I played through the song with them, and, and they must have left some kind of impression and uh, a couple of days later they asked me to join them what was the um so i kind of picture your career up until that point as um you're working with the club band and dipping in and out doing sessions and then now you're joining a fairly established um band did it feel quite a comfortable thing they weren't completely established at that point. They they were just on the brink of playing bigger bigger auditoriums. Uh, you know, going from like large theaters into small arenas. Okay. Uh, it was kind of at that stage of the man's career that. Um, yeah, and throughout that. Uh, close to the edge tour that we did, the band grew quite a lot. And uh, then we ended up by playing big arenas like Madison Square Gardens and stuff like that. Yeah. Was was it um, at the point where you went off to do that tour? I guess it was a, a full-time job. I know you've obviously played with them ever since and, and they're long, the longest running member of the band. But would, did it feel quite comfortable joining joining a project that was... Um, I mean, at the time, yeah. you didn't know it was going to be sort of forever, but... I must say the band made me feel accommodated, you know, because they knew it was no... Um, no easy task to step in in three days, learn the whole repertoire, you know, um, all first three albums, really. And, and I don't know, I, we were all really nervous, and especially Chris Grier, he was sweating bullets. <laughs> um, and uh, we. we <laughs> We got on stage and um, and I remember the sense of feeling when we came up and thinking, God, I think I got everything right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Chris said, I think you got everything right. But, you know, on the second, third and fourth gig, 
Um, I <laughs> well, things start. I I started making more and more mistakes, but about about the fourth gig, I pulled it all back together, and <laughs> and I I said, well, I'll stay in the band for three months, or um, you can you can judge me with the band for three months, and um, so, and. Uh, <laughs> And then we'll work it out from there, see if it's both happy. And, oh my God, I'm looking at my bird feeder outside. It's got a woodpecker on it. <laughs> now we stay drilling holes in the wood. <laughs> um, oh, oh, sorry about that. No, you're yeah, fine. You... I don't think I've ever seen a woodpecker yeah. in, the, in the wild before. The biggest. It's actually not much seed left, and they're gonna they're gonna get it all. There's two of them. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. We, when we're out here. Way with the milk. I know. I'm gonna let it go. I'm just saying we're kind of out in the country at the foot of the mountains. Our house, so we're you know one of our activities we've taken up during COVID was bird watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, we get a few here. I. I have um, a little three-year-old girl and we have a robin that comes to visit our garden occasionally and she loves it. Oh, well, Gigi's got a robin that's in front and back of the house and he's been coming for months. <laughs> um, what what did the change feel like? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that when you were doing the club circuit, um, even, I guess, around the late 60s, early 70s, that you were playing sort of two, three-minute songs and then suddenly you're on stage playing 10, 11, 12-minute um, <laughs> kind of medleys. Uh, it just became the norm, really. Um, I got really used to it and uh, it was more like telling a story, you know, um, every song. And a lot of Yes songs um, that are really long like that have a recurrent theme that's played in different ways and shapes and form, you know? Yeah. And uh, all you got to do is remember which one comes next. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm really conscious of, uh, of taking up more of your time, especially seeing as we started a little late. Um, and I'm, I really appreciate you coming to speak to me. It's, it's so interesting uh, hearing your stories. Uh, Fine. Well, we're in amid the COVID lockdown, as it were, to a degree. It's a bit better now, but uh, still, you've got to be careful. Well, as as we know, at least you can get a pint. I'm I'm very jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's all right. I don't drink that much. I love. I'll have a one this afternoon and one this evening. That's about enough for me nowadays. Lovely. Um, just, just f f finally, I know um, you're involved in a, a fair few um, organisations promoting the arts up in Seattle now. Is that is that how you're spending most of your time? Um, sort of in. Are you? It sounds like you're inputting back into the community, the music community up in Seattle. Yeah. With community stuff, yeah, I find myself doing a lot of kind of charity shows and um, events. I'll just turn up and go there. So, and people really respect what you've done because um, Seattle's a pretty musical city. I know that music matters. I know, yeah. I think you're talking about music matters. Um <laughs> It's it's music aid northwest. That's um, right. Yeah, we we started that. Uh, how many years ago now? About ten or yeah, twelve, fifteen years ago, and um, it's doing really well. We we don't have as much time to do it as we used to, but um, we have a license plate. Sorry, he's not explaining it. We have a license plate we started for, it says Music Matters, and all the um, the special license plate, when you get it on your car, a percentage goes to, we have a committee 
that gives out grant money and it goes to support a music education in our schools all over the state of Washington. Oh, amazing. So it's grown over the years and it's doing really well now. And I have to say there's a lot of satisfaction driving down the road when you see our license plate on other cars and, you know, they're all supporting music education. So I think that's maybe what you're referring to. Yeah, that's what, you know, um, so I think it, what it is is when you get a a new number plate for your car, which in America you have to do, um, it's mandatory. But um, you can pay thirty dollars extra, get a specialized one, um, and we have a one that's got music matters on it, and. Uh, I think it's about 30 bucks every time, and that goes into a fund, you know, to give to schools for music education. Because we all know the first thing they cut at school is the music, you know, and uh, it's not good. Absolutely. I think I'm on the committee that um, reviews the grant requests, and I think this last year we gave away over $120,000. Wow. Cool. So it's uh, it's growing every year. It's perpetual. So that's um yeah, it's something. It's not everything, but something. If everybody does a little, you know, it helps. Absolutely. I mean, it it really rang true with me. And I, I um I I kind of gave in on. I I did some school um one to one teaching when I first started in sort of my music career, and and it it died to death. And then school music teaching is going downhill. So when I when I read it on on um, Alan's website, it really struck a chord with me. So I wanted to bring it up because I think it's amazing that you're taking an interest in it and doing something about it. Yeah, uh, we've been Absolutely. we've been doing yeah. it for quite a lot it's of years. That yeah. important, yeah, it's that important. Because um, you know, it's been, it's a proven fact that um, your academic. Um, Life at school is a, when you play a music in, instrument seems to be much better, and the percentages show that. I, I think that's right. That uh, you know they say kids concentrate better when they're learning. They they learn uh, when they're learning an instrument. They focus in lessons better. Behavior is better. Um, everything's better. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it, it yeah. enhances your whole education. Yeah. It's like when you get told when you're a kid, you know, it's good to play two instruments instead of one. And one always reflects on the other, and it it really helps. It's the same same kind of analogy. Exactly. Um, I'll let you get on with your day. I know it's approaching lunchtime. I, I thank you again um, for speaking to me. It has been a real privilege and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. So there we are, Alan White. Um, and as usual, I hope that you enjoyed listening to that conversation as uh, much as I enjoyed having it. Um, I'm sure you'll agree. Alan is just a really unassuming chap and um, incredibly talented. And it's so amazing to um, to hear some of those stories. Um, and he seemed uh, very candid in the way that he uh, talked about his experiences. Um, so uh, next week I am chatting to um, Rich Bagano, who is the drummer for the Fab Faux. Um, I did warn you, we have a fairly drum-heavy few <laughs> a few episodes coming up, um, which I hope that you're finding interesting. As I said last time, I know a lot of the artists I work with enjoy talking drums, even if they don't play drums themselves. Um, so anyway, yeah, Rich Pagano plays with the Fab Faux and he also runs um, a course uh, called The Art of Recording Classic Drums um, in New York. And uh, he's a ridiculously talented guy. He's a writer and he's a drummer. Um, I mean, composer, writer um, and uh, recording engineer and producer. Just ridiculous. And there's a... Uh, it's a bit of a technical episode. There's a lot of technical information there, so it's definitely one to get your uh, your pens and papers out. Um, and again, Rich is super generous with his knowledge and his time. Um, 
So that's that, um, which only leaves me to say, if you'd like to contact me at all, um, my email address is joe at all you need is drums, and you can find out more about me and the, the drum sessions I do and that kind of thing at www.allyouneedisdrums.com. Um, in fact, while I'm here, I should mention, I, I've had a few emails from people who listen to the podcast and who also subscribe to the stems that I do, um, asking whether or not I offer bespoke drum services for people's tracks and that is exactly what i do <laughs> when i'm not recording this podcast and i'm not um making drum stem you know beatles covers drum stems and um, i spend most of my time recording drums on other people's tracks so if that's something that interests you then go and visit my website and have a look um, and feel free to get in touch um because i'd love to hear your music um yeah and uh, if if you have ideas for guests for this or feedback for the podcast, then uh, definitely get in touch with me. Um, I'd like to say my usual thank yous to Mr. Joe Kane, who was on last uh, episode, for um, producing the incredible intro and outro music. Um, and also a big thank you to my good friend David Henshaw for the beautiful artwork that he supplies. Um, and have a lovely and safe couple of weeks. And I will speak to you soon. Goodbye. 